Well, when we set sail with Jesus a few weeks back, our voyage began pretty much the same way it did with the disciples. In fact, that's the first disciples, that's where we began. Um, well, quite specifically, we began with Luke's version of that, which is a little bit more interesting than just Jesus saw fishermen by the lake shore and said, come and follow me. There's a little bit more detail there, which was great because that gave us an opportunity to explore some other things like how Jesus already knew Simon because he'd been in the area and he'd been preaching and stuff. And I'm sure Simon came home one day after a busy day of fishing to find Jesus sitting on his front step because he stayed overnight. And then the next morning, he's walking down where Peter is and they've just been fishing. They come back in, they haven't caught really anything. And and uh, Jesus wants to bar- borrow the boat so he can teach from it, right? So he sits in the boat, he teaches. You remember the story. Do you remember what happens next? Okay, so that's the point at which, that's the point at which in the other stories, basically Jesus just says, come with me, and off they go. But what Luke says is that when he finished teaching in the boat, Jesus said to P- Simon, Go out again. And this time, go to the really deep water. And they do, and they catch a pile of fish. And then, Jesus says, come with me. And we'll go and fish for people together. And off they go. Off they go into that life of traveling and living and working with Jesus And that is full of so many stories that we know so well, and some probably that we don't know as well as we should. But all of the Gospels tell this story of Jesus having a a small group of followers who he worked with. Right, And three of those Gospels tell this story of its fishermen. And so off they go, and they do all sorts of amazing things. And there's miracle stories, and there's healings, and there's teaching and stuff. And there's this great story about Jesus teaching, and it's been a long day, and that he wants to get to the other side of the lake. And so he says to the disciples at the end of the day, let's get in the boat, and we'll just, we'll go now. And off they go in the dark. And a storm comes up. Jesus is having a nap in the back because he's been working hard all day, right? And... The storm comes up. The disciples don't know what to do. They need help. They wake up Jesus. Jesus calms the storm. They get to the other side. It's a great story about how similar situation. Jesus has been working all day. He wants a little private, personal time this time. So he sends the disciples on ahead in a boat. And they're out on the water and a storm comes up. And things are not going well. And Jesus sees what's happening from the shore. And so he walks across the water towards them. And as he gets there, when they finally recognize who it is, Simon Peter again says, "If if you invite me out, I'll come walk on the water with you. So he steps out on the water. And he takes a few steps, and he's doing fine until he's afraid, and then suddenly starts to sink. And what does he do? He calls out to Jesus, of course, save me, and Jesus reaches out a hand, helps him into the boat. These are both stories, by the way, where we tend to interpret those stories as, where is your faith in me? But what if they were stories about, where's your faith in you? Guys are experienced fishermen, Be calm and do what you know best, and you'll get through this. Peter, you were doing it. You were walking on the water. You were already doing it. It was only when you were afraid that you started to sink. You can do it. Where's your faith in you? And then things don't go so well. Jesus is arrested. You can imagine how scared the closest followers of Jesus would be when Jesus gets arrested. Not just because Jesus has just been arrested, but 
we are close personal friends with that guy who was just arrested. What's gonna, are they going to come for us next? We better hide. Not only is Jesus arrested, he's tried and he's killed. Now we have not just fear, but the grief of look how well this was going. Look what we were doing. Look at these amazing things that were happening. And now Jesus is gone. And then something else happens. Something truly amazing. A wonder. Jesus is alive again. It's ama- Imagine the roller coaster of all of that. You left your life behind. All that you knew, you left behind to go with Jesus. You were doing great things. You were learning great stuff. It wasn't always easy. It wasn't. It wasn't all just joy and celebration. Some of it was hard work. Some of it was disappointment, perhaps. And then, and then, the unthinkable happens. Although, maybe you should have anticipated that because, you know, he was kind of saying stuff that was annoying people. And he wasn't particularly wanting to be particularly conciliatory about, you know, how he did that or particularly, you know, friendly with the leaders of the temple. Um, And, you know, they're friends with the Romans. Imagine, just imagine where you're at now after you, all that's happened. All that's happened. And right at the end of the Gospel of John, and by the end of the Gospel of John, I mean the first ending, um, the end of chapter 20 sounds like it's the end of the book. We've had the resurrection. Uh, Jesus has been seen by Mary. She's been, he's been seen by the d- other disciples. The story of Thomas. Remember the story of Thomas, the one who doubted? We talk about that another time because it's not really about that. But nonetheless, that's all happened. Jesus has said those great words about my peace I give to you. And now as, as God sent me, I send you out into the world. Off you go then. And then the author of the Gospel of John writes this little two or three line paragraph that basically says, yeah, so that's why we've written down these stories so that you'll know all this good stuff. And yeah, the end. Then there's chapter 21. Now, It would be really easy, and lots of people have kind of said, somebody added that later, except almost all, almost all of the oldest versions of the gospel that we have, have 21. They have that piece at the end. And so maybe, maybe, here's some thinking, um, maybe the person who wrote the gospel of John had an afterthought and added an epilogue. Maybe what they thought was, after you've been through all of this, after you've been through all this, you left your life behind. You've been on this roller coaster of life with Jesus. In the last couple of weeks, all this stuff's happened. You've got, you've got fear and grief. You've got joy. You've got I don't know what to think going on. You've been through a lot. What would you do? Well, it would be nice to think that because Jesus said, I send you, that you would go out and be Jesus in the world. But what if the author of the Gospel of John thought, I know lots of human beings, and not very many of them are going to do that. What they're going to do is, they're going to go back to what's comfortable, what's familiar. They're going to go back to something that they know for sure they can hold on to because they've been through so much. Of course you're going to want to do that. You're going to want to go back to something you know for certain. And and what these guys know is fishing. They're going to go back to that life. So here's another story. Here's a story where they do just that. And Jesus appears to them again. Here's an opportunity to recognize, here's an opportunity to recognize that when we've been through a lot, sometimes we need, well, we need more than somebody just saying, go and do what I showed you. We need time. We need time. And we need an opportunity to 
address what we've experienced, to deal with what we've experienced, to have a moment, to have a moment before we go forward. How long is that moment going to be? Well, who knows? Everyone's going to be different, right? But here's Jesus appearing again. And what does Jesus say? Well, the first thing he says is very similar in John. It's very similar to the very thing that he said to uh, the, the, first, the disciples when he first called them in, in Luke. He gave them an example of what's ahead. So in, in, in Luke, here's Jesus going, go to the deep water and look at what you find. Now come with me, because we're going to do that. And they do. And what do they do when they're traveling with Jesus? Well, they go to the deep water is what they do. And they, they find what's there, the abundance of, of, of life that's in that. And having experienced all of this trauma, all of this grief, all of what they've experienced with Jesus, and they want to go back to something, they, they just want to go back to the, you know, the good old days. Jesus says, try something different. Try the other side. Try the other side of the boat. Do something opposite. Try it. Just try it. Because you see, you see how you've gone back to what it is you know, and what have you found there? Well, you've worked all night, you haven't caught a fish. I suppose if you're putting these two stories, the story from Luke and the story of John together, that is actually what their life was like, um, but it wasn't the life that they wanted. What did you catch? Nothing. So try something else. Try something different. Because you can't go back. You can only go forward. And forward, forward means new. It means trying something different. It means trying something new. And they do that, and what do they find? An abundance of life. There's, there's more to this little story, of course. There's, they, they go to the shore, and they have breakfast with Jesus, and uh, there's this great conversation between Jesus and, and Peter um, about, do you love me? Well, if you do, then go and... And we've got to move on from, sh- from fish eventually. Feed my sheep. I will be with you. Now go and do something different. Do what I taught you. Don't go back to those that, what's old and comfortable. Go forward into something new. I wonder if the author of John wasn't thinking... People are going to be hearing this story. They're going to get to the end of this story, and they're going to think all they have to do is just hear Jesus say, go and do, and off they'll go. No, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we need to recognize the fact that people, when they've experienced a lot, they want to go back and find something that's familiar, a certainty and all that's unknown now. But there, there is, there is, by the way, something. There is something to hold on to. There's Jesus. And in the story from Luke, this is Jesus saying, come with me, we'll go together. And at the end of John, after the resurrection, here's Jesus saying, go with me. You go, I will be with you. You know I'm with you. You've spent all this time with me. You've learned all of this stuff from me. You've heard me preach. You've heard me talk. You know me. Now, go and be me in the world. I will be with you. I don't know exactly how it's going to go for you. I don't. And you don't either. But I will be with you. As God sent me into the world, I send you out now. Not alone. I am with you.
So the voyage continues, of course. We don't just say, oh, we did five weeks traveling with Jesus, so we're done now. We're all good. Any more than the, the disciples could do that. Those first disciples, those first people who traveled with Jesus. They couldn't get to the end of that journey and go, oh, we're good, thanks, yep. For all that we've learned and all that we know, there is no certainty of how we go forward. There's questions. There's, there's the unknown. There's doubts. There's all of those things. Jesus goes with us. God goes with us. The Spirit goes with us and inspires us. That's where we find the abundance of life. That's, that's where we find what we are thankful for. It's not just in the, the events of the past. It's not just in remembering the great traditions. It's not just in, in how comfortable we were when this happened. But in stepping forward with Jesus and creating and building and finding new what is life in the world.